Well, good afternoon, everyone. Let me take off my mask. I assure you, I won't be closer than two meters to you. And so we'll take off this mask. I want to welcome everybody to our AMA, our Ask Me Anything. Um, who would have thought we would be where we are right now? I guess nobody. So in March of 2020, we started our AMA. So as you all know, we are condominium lawyers. I'm Brian Horlick and our practice focuses on assisting condominium corporations and those that act for them, such as the hardworking condo managers in your building. In March of 2020, there was a COVID outbreak that came to light. It was an emergency order that was put in place. The condominium managers, the board members who pretty well in this industry are always communicating and speaking to one another, suddenly found themselves staying at home not going to work, not being able to to communicate. And so what we decided to do as an office in order to assist the condominium industry, we decided to put forward an AMA, Ask Me Anything web stream to allow the owners, the managers, the board members, anybody really involved in condos to have a forum to get together, to ask questions, and in a sense, learn from each other and, and, and find out you know, what was going on with COVID and other things related to condo. We decided to continue the AMA throughout COVID and because of the tremendous outpouring of love and affection from so many managers and board members, we were of the view that we should continue this until COVID and then after that to continue it going forward. So here we are after the first emergency order was rescinded and that order turned into the ROA, the Reopening of Ontario Act, and things seemed to be getting better. You know, we were out this summer and we were exercising and going for walks and the cases were down. And here we are back not only where we started, but worse than where we started with a new emergency order um, being proclaimed by the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford. This happened yesterday. So the emergency order is back. Why do we have an emergency order? We have an emergency order so the government can put in place emergency regulations and, and, and advice and recommendations to assist with this COVID-19 pandemic. So we continue our task, we continue assisting, we continue our AMA, and we hope you will find it of value in addition to our AMAs. And again, that's every Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon. We do have what we call a case law corner. We have a written brief summary of important condominium cases. You can find that as well on our YouTube channel. And to add to the cases, we have one of our condominium lawyers record a short three minute video, maximum three minute video with respect to what those cases are all about. So we encourage you to become a condominium genius. Then you won't need condo lawyers. I shouldn't say that. But if you go to see the cases, they're brief, they're to the point. It's a short video with a short summary, three minute maximum. And they're very interesting if you are practicing either management or being a director, you need to have this information. Again, we continue to send out a weekly FAQ, a frequently asked question um, e-blast that we send out every Monday or Tuesday, depending upon what the government is 
uh, if, if they're making any announcements or not. So every Monday or Tuesday, I know that all the condominium lawyers gather around their computers and they wait for our FAQ to come out so they can read it, so they can understand what's happening in condominium law with respect to COVID-19 and other things. These are the things that we're doing. And for those of you that, again, have been tuned into our YouTube channel, we instituted HLD meetings, whereby we now have our own exclusive state-of-the-art electronic voting software. We have used our electronic voting software to chair virtual AGMs and other owner meetings. We have chaired hundreds and hundreds of meetings for the condominium community and we continue to do so. So if you have an AGM that's coming up or if you want to pass any type of bylaws or declaration amendments, obviously you can't do that in an in-person meeting. We are happy to assist you with our electronic voting software. So let's first of all discuss the stay at home order. The government in an effort to combat the alarming increase in COVID-19 cases in an effort to um, try to ward off what appears to be uh, potential critical issues in um, intensive care units and hospitalizations. Uh, the government has issued a stay at home order. And for those of you that don't understand what it means, it means you need to stay at home. I'm sure I'm going to be asked for legal opinions on whether stay at home means you don't have to stay at home. And if, if people don't understand stay at home, um, I will write that legal opinion to them. Now, there's a stay at home order. It's going to be effective uh, right after midnight tonight. There's going to be certain exemptions to the stay at home order. And so, I'm going to preface everything that I'm saying now and for this entire, um, you know, um, this entire discussion. Um, the government comes out with um, a press conference. This is, this is what's been happening. The government comes out with a press conference and they make the announcements as to uh, what's happening as far as the restrictions. Uh, before they do that, it's sort of like a like theater. You know, they don't come out and say, we're, you know, we're going to have a press conference tomorrow. There's a buildup. It's sort of like they give you like a preview to a movie and they give you a buildup. Oh, it's not going to be so good. We're going to have lots of restrictions and you have to wait for all of this time while they give you these previews of what's to come. And then they give you the bad news at the press conference. So they don't want to kill you at the press conference. They, they kill you slowly. So press conferences, they come out, but always the law which is the regulations that we as lawyers have to read to give proper legal information those regulations don't come out at the same time as the press conferences the regulations usually come out the next day or even two days later and so what happens is that you know the government's well-meaning they come on and they give um a a uh, press conference or the city of toronto public health gives a press conference then we as condo lawyers get asked all sorts of questions. What do they mean? And we can't exactly tell you what they mean until we read the regs or we read the legislation. And we are in the same position right now where we have the stay at home order, but the regs aren't out yet. And until such time as we read the regulations, we're not going to be able to give you 100% advice. So I'm just going to read this out to you. Um, effective Thursday, January the 14th at midnight, or a, a second past midnight, the government is issuing a stay-at-home order requiring everyone to remain at home with exceptions for essential purposes, such as going to the grocery store or the pharmacy, accessing, accessing health care services, exercising, or for essential work. The work, this order, and the new and existing public health restrictions are aimed at limiting people's mobility and reducing the number of daily contacts with those outside an immediate household. In addition to limiting outings to essential trips, 
and this is important, all businesses must ensure that any employee who can work from home does work from home. So we'll have to see exactly what that means, but I'm confident given that lawyers write these things that I'll still be able to go to work at the office, but we'll have to see. So this is what's happening. Um, the, the, there's a stay at home order. Everyone is required to stay home. There are exceptions for essential reasons, such as the grocery store, the pharmacy, the doctor, um, the dentist, exercising. So you're allowed to leave your house and go for a walk. You're allowed to walk through the parks and the ravines, and you're allowed to do essential work, um, provided that the, uh, if you can work from home, uh, you should be doing that. Um, in addition, um, outdoor gatherings are now restricted um, to a maximum of five people. So if you are going out in a group for your exercise, whatever, maximum five people in the social gathering outdoors. And again, always maintaining the minimum two meters of uh, social distancing. Uh, masks, of course, are mandatory for inside. Um, a non-essential retail will, will be open, but with restricted hours. And of course, food stores and big box stores are going to be open, of course. So that's what you've got. You've got your um, stay-at-home order. That is the latest. I'm not going to say it's the latest and the greatest, but it's just the latest. Next, City of Toronto. Um, came out with a letter of instruction and I'm just going to quickly review that before we go to a uh, no number of questions that we have here. So under the um, reopening of Ontario Act um, there is the um, provision um, for mandatory compliance uh, with advice recommendation recommendations and instructions from public health officials. So today when the public officials are making a recommendation or giving you advice, um, you must follow that. And that's with, that is in the regulations, uh, regulation 82 slash 20, and that is the regulation for the reopening of Ontario Act, ROA. And just so that you know, uh, many of um, the provisions that were formerly in the first Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act um, that, that were uh, part and parcel of that. Many of the restrictions after the first emergency order was rescinded, the restrictions went into the reopening of Ontario Act. So they're in there now. So, as I said, the um, you are compelled and com to comply with the advice, recommendation, and instructions of the public health officials. And the one of the public health officials, of course, um, is the um, City of Toronto um, Health Department. And there was a letter of instruction that came out on January the 4th, 2021. And it was from Dr. Eileen Davila, who's the Medical Officer of Health. And so this um, letter of instruction is applicable and enforceable within the City of Toronto. And it basically set out that there are notification requirements for COVID-19 outbreaks. And, and that specifically in the condominium, in the condominium context, it's, it's set out that condo managers are now required to notify Toronto Public Health immediately upon becoming aware of two or more people testing positive for COVID-19 in connection with the condo property within a 14-day interval. Sounds pretty simple. Condo managers must notify Toronto Public Health upon becoming aware of two or more people testing positive for COVID-19 within a 14-day inter interval. And of course, as it has been the habit when the instructions come out and the advice comes out and the re recommendations come out, when you read it, it never seems to, um, there's always a loophole in there. There's always a confusion in there because none of the stuff seems to be drafted uh, 
with total 100% uh, thought. It's, it's thought about, but not fully. And so the question becomes, of course, the condo managers, managers must notify the health department when two or more people test positive. Well, who's the people, right? Um, it, it's supposed to be, as I understood it, um, the letter of instruction was headed Toronto Public Health Instructions for Workplaces. And of course, condos are workplaces for condo managers. You would think that the reporting requirement uh, deals with workers. And so if there's two or more workers that test positive for COVID-19 within the 14 day interval, um, that would trigger the um, reporting requirement or the notification requirement. But unfortunately, um, there's a definition um, in the letter of instruction and it relates to workers. Um, now, of course, people, um, the, the word people is a much broader word than workers. And so the question now becomes in many managers' minds is do we have to notify if people being, you know, which would include residents, if two or more residents test positive for COVID within a 14 day interval, does that trigger the notif the, notif the notification requirements or not, or is it just workers? And so what happens is um, people are confused as you know, with the, the manner in which these um, things are presented. And so lawyers, managers, board members, etc., call up, you know, the health department and ask questions. And then, you know, somebody there picks up the phone and says, oh, yeah, this is how, how you interpret it or that's how you interpret it. And then, you know, somebody sends out an email blast and, oh, OK, this is how it's going to work now because I spoke to this guy who answered the phone at whatever department. And, you know, I, I, you can bet your bottom dollar that, um, you know, th that uh, information from the guy who picked up the phone and gave you the in information is likely to be. Um, inaccurate. I was going to say wrong, but I thought it would be a little bit more polite. Inaccurate. So, as far as I'm concerned, um, a people is broader than a worker, and the notification requirements would include uh, residents um, testing positive for COVID-19. And I will tell you there's a debate about that. All right. So, if there is a COVID outbreak, there is a uh, positive um, obligation on the manager to notify Toronto Public Health and then if there's an outbreak the manager has to provide Toronto Public Health with a designate, designated contact person and provide up-to-date contact information um, to the Public Health Department and the Ministry of Labor. In addition there have been uh, in the letter of instruction uh, there's now positive obligations as if you needed positive obligations but there are with respect to providing hand sanitizers and hand washing facilities in the areas where workers are present. Um, workers are recommended not to share a vehicle for work purposes, to keep two meters distancing, and if physical distancing is not possible, then to have physical barriers and install one-way walkways as well. So all of this relates to condos, uh, specifically high rises. Now, one of the things that the letter of instruction also said, which is quite interesting, is that the condos should be conducting a regular review of the HVAC systems in the building to ensure that they are functioning well. Um, so regular review is not defined. So I suggest that you call your HVAC company with respect to that. But I do have to make another mention again, and, and I do sometimes um, to this fellow called Rudy Petershofer. And Rudy um, is a, was a condo manager, um, then became a regional manager, um, and now is um, in a educational and, um, I guess, regulatory role over at Crossbridge. And Rudy had sent me some very interesting information uh, dealing with HVAC equipment um, and dealing with um, uh, in making sure that they are work, uh, functioning well uh, due to respiratory droplets, etc. And the first time he sent that to me, I thought he was nuts. I said, whoa, what are you talking about, Rudy? And as I read it, I started to realize that, in fact, 
The HVAC system is very important with respect to the spread of respiratory droplets, i.e. and COVID-19. So again, uh, my hat, which I will only wear outside when it's really cold, um, goes off to Rudy for his um, forward thinking with respect to the HVAC equipment. Now, we're going to move on to some questions here. And then we're going to discuss some policies. All right, let's go to the people at home. And I say you're at home, you better be at home by tonight. All right, Harlan Stavis, noted troublemaker. He is a director in a high-rise condo, and he is a hard-working guy. Good afternoon. Hope all's well in these crazy times. I know that the board can institute a no visitors policy. How can it be enforced? Does all construction such as rentals, painting, etc., can they be stopped? So there's nothing worse than starting off an exam with a hard question. So Harlan, good questions. Uh, number one, um, again, as we said before, condo corporations are able to and can uh, institute policies which are um, more stringent than the requirements set out in the guidelines by the city, by the health uh, department, public health officials, etc. So you are able to do that and there's a case called the Fraser case which we'll get to a bit later that said just that. So condo corporations can institute policies that are more expansive than the uh, the city or the provincial guidelines all right so if you wanted to have a no visitors policy uh, a number of condo corporations are putting out uh, policies and one of them one of those policies deals with no visitors and the question of course is you know can it be enforced and you know as part and parcel of the stay at home order there the there has there have been given the uh, there's been put forward um, f uh, more stringent enforcement proceed uh, provisions so uh, provincial offenses officers uh, police uh, uh, bylaw officers can um, enforce the uh, provincial orders and i would suggest that if you're going to institute a no visitors policy of course you need to have certain exemptions there because the stay-at-home uh, rule does have exemptions, and uh, if you are um, someone who needs a caretaker, if you have uh, people coming up, um, you know, f providing essential services, you would need to have an exemption in your no visitors policy, but it can be done, um, and it can be done in an intelligent way. So, for example, if there are residents that um, need or have, um, you know, uh, uh, home caretakers, uh, caretakers coming, to assist them, uh, then, you know, those type of things can be uh, provided, that information can be provided to the concierge or security, and they, they should therefore be able to um, come up to the owner's uh, or the resident's unit without having any issues. Similarly, um, in the stay-at-home um, order, there is an exemption um, for um, for for those people that are uh, single or by themselves to be able to have uh, people come in, a limited uh, amount of people to come in um, uh, to visit. So there are exemptions to that, but it definitely can be done. The question is enforceability. I think you are putting the condo corporation and the its employees, the concierge, security, etc., um, in an awkward uh, position. Um, if you're going to, um, you know, take excessive steps to try to enforce that, you may want to advise all residents that th these uh, type of policies will be enforced by the regular by the authorities, such as the the police and such as you know provincial um, offenses officers and bylaw officers who will be called uh, by the uh, corporation employees or the concierge uh, in the event of uh, breaches of those policies. So I don't think it's you know, I think you have to you have to set out your policies in writing. You have to set them out appropriately. Uh, we can assist the corporations who want to do that. We do that all the time. 
but uh, as far as the enforcement is concerned, you know, after, you know, the concierge says, well, I'm sorry, there's no visitors. If someone's going to say like, F you, I'm going up, you know, you're not going to, you know, get the concierge to tackle the guy. You would then pick up the phone and call the uh, enforcement uh, uh, people to, to come by. We have another question here from Donald Bala. Um, he is a hardworking manager at a condo down by the lake and he never has enough hours in a day so Donald we're going to send you more hours how's that good afternoon Brian are contractors allowed to proceed with renovation work in condos any specific restrictions that we are legally required to abide by well again uh, I will tell you the regulations are not out but the um, press conference said that projects that involve renovations to residential properties uh, and construction work started before January the 12th would be fine. Um, so the work has to be started before January the 12th, it seems, in order to continue as a residential construction. Um, but again, I haven't read the regulations yet because, quote unquote, they're coming. They're not out yet. It would seem, just from what I've uh, heard, um, that if you haven't started your uh, residential construction before January the 12th, which was yesterday, you're not going to be able to start new construction. But again, I, I need to uh, review the regs. I will tell you this, once we do review the regs, uh, we'll be sending out an updated FAQ. So keep your eye open for that. If you're not on the email list, you know, you can email me. It's not a problem. And I'm going to send out, I'll put you on the list and you'll get the FAQ. But that's going to be you know, the law after we review the regs and you will have 100% your answer there. Danielle Kasha, good afternoon, Brian. Danielle, how are you? You were on vacation recently. Danielle's also a hardworking manager in Mississauga. Dorina Ratchu, a contractor insists to install wallpaper in his grandmother's powder room this coming Friday. He claims that he is exempted from the government regulations. He is a contractor not an owner. Well, um, you know, the uh, prohibition on construction projects has nothing to do uh, with whether you're a relative or not. If you are involved in a construction project, and I'm going to say that if you're going to be doing work in the unit, that's a construction project. And, you know, you're not going to be able to say, well, you know, I'm renovating my unit, but it's my brother-in-law's company. And, you know, therefore I'm exempt. I don't agree you're not going to be able to do it. But Dorina, again, the regs are going to be coming out. It'll be in our up-to-date FAQ, and you'll know the answer shortly. But, um, you know, exemptions are not based on, you know, family status. All right. And um, we have here Catherine Barbellini. I'm afraid to read the question because her questions are always so difficult. I need to have more lawyers come in and assist on the answers. If you've been listening before to these um, um, AMAs, you know that Catherine Barbellini is a condo manager and that's her fallback position because what she should have been in life was a condo lawyer because she knows, I would say, as much or more than most condo lawyers. So Catherine, your question. A resident owns two homes, one in Niagara, and one in Toronto, are they restricted from travel? So I guess Catherine, being Catherine, is saying that even though there's a stay-at-home order, what is home? So if you have two homes, can, you can't stay at home in two homes. You got to stay in one home. Um, you know, I'm going to suggest that the whole purpose of the stay-at-home order is you shouldn't be traveling. You should stay in your home, and. To me, the resident needs to decide where's their home. Um, it, it's, um, you know, otherwise you're going to defeat the whole purpose of a stay-at-home order because you could say, well, you know, I have a house here, but I have a home there, and, you know, I'm staying with my friend over there. Not good. Not good. Rudy Petershofer, look at that. Love and affection. I think you're brilliant, Brian, but I'm not sure about love and affection. Rudy, we love you. We love you for, for your insight. And, and uh, if you can come up with something to beat your comment on, 
you know, the respiratory droplets, we're dying to hear what you have to say. Gary Wine, how can we enforce wearing of masks by all residents in elevators and all common areas? Oh, this question makes me crazy. Why is it that, you know, the government puts forward legislation to protect people, to assist people, to make sure that to the best of their ability, everybody is as safe as possible and as safe as can be. And there are these, we call them COVID idiots, that, that refuse to comply with simple requirements of wearing a mask. Um, and so the question is, how can a condo enforce wearing the masks by all residents in elevators and common areas? The number one thing, of course, is there's legislation, there's the policies that everybody would have put out. In a lot of the condo declarations, um, there may be an ability to charge back, uh, infor uh, charge back legal fees for enforcement procedures with respect to that. And I would counsel you, Gary, to look at your deck, see what you have there as far as ind indemnification for legal costs, and really take this and, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm a crazy tough guy, but slam anybody who's not wearing the mask. Really, it's, it's just an awful thing and highly irresponsible. Next question. Paulo Tavares. Now, Paulo is a regional manager at Crossbridge. When he's not doing that, he's a singer. He has a beautiful, deep baritone voice. And if you ever go to a tavern, you'll see him singing. Unfortunately, he's subject to a stay-at-home order so he's singing now in his shower. Paulo, hi Brian. If we are doing work in units after water damage, post-emergency cleanup, can we continue that work? Okay, so again, I hate to say this, but it's all in the regs. To me, if you're going to be doing um, post-emergency cleanup, as opposed to, you know, renovations, you know, I'm going to assume that you'll be able to do that. Um, and you'll be able to do it up to the point where you make the unit livable. But I don't think, you know, if you're going to do th things further than that, I'm sure you won't be able to continue. But again, it's going to be in the regs. But if it's an emergency cleanup and, you, you know, obviously a person can't live there because of the water and the potential mold, that's probably something that you can do. Here's a question from Rainbow. Would annual fire inspections be considered essential? including in-suite inspections. Well, you know, we've had this debate where unit owners and residents are not very happy um, in having people come into their units during the COVID period of time. And, you know, people are quite concerned. You've got the um, inspection companies. This is what they do. And part of doing their job is to go from unit to unit to inspect. And this is um, uh, not something that um, many owners are enthusiastic about. So, you know, I have seen um, in, the, in the many condos that we represent, in a number of cases, annual fire inspections have been deferred. Not great, but, you know, you're, you're between a rock and a hard place there. Leo Alvarez. Hi, Brian. Hello, Leo. Vivid. 2457 message retracted. All right. Leo Alvarez. Hi, Brian. With cleaning of clothes dryers and duct work, which are in really bad condition as fire prevention be allowed. Well, again, you know, we want to take a look at the regs, but anything that is um, of an emergency a situation where, you know, there, it potentially could cause for, in this case, let's say a, a fire hazard, is something that you need to seriously consider as an exemption and and we would you know review the regs for that but it sounds you know when you're getting to the point as, as paulo set out before where there's a, you know a damage due to flooding uh, where there's you know fire prevention um you know where things are on the verge of maybe you know a catastrophic event you know these are the things that should be subject to an exemption David DeRose, there is a maintenance clause that allows most construction work to continue in residential buildings. We would appreciate your thoughts on this clause. So, you know, I, again, 
I really want to look at the regs when they're out to see how the regs are affecting um, the um, you know construction. Again, maintenance is not you know maintenance doesn't have to be construction. So we do we we do need to look at the regs. I wish I could give you something more definitive, but I will tell you, David, um, that as soon as the regs come out, we're going to be answering some of these questions in our FAQ with 100% certainty. I'd rather give the certain answer than, you know, it might be this or it might be that. Um, Pirapa Kaji says, hello, how are you doing? Thank you. Vivid 24, 57 is back. It, is the construction projects for the building envelope being affected by these new restrictions? So there are major construction uh, projects that uh, have exemptions. Um, and again, we'll have to check um, on that specific item. Um, but I will tell you that um, a lot of the construction won't be going forward uh, unless, of course, it's already in process. But there are exemptions for major construction projects. You know, we would have to check, you know, the building envelope issue for you. And, and I have no problem to do that. Paulo Tavares says, thank you. I will go practice my singing now. Well, that's fine. If your wife is home, just go into the shower, all right? I'll just tell you that. Free piece of advice. Alexandra Homison, great manager in North York. How are you? Hi, Brian. This is from another property manager. I would assume this would be the case for informing Toronto Public Health and Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Labor two, or make case, two or more cases concurrent. Yes, two or more. it's two or more cases within... 14 days. Um, and then the property manager, hello, did the Supporting on Recovery Act pass? So you're talking about um, the ROA, um, which is the, um, the act that came into place after the emergency order uh, was, was uh, lifted. So that 100% is in... in uh, that's 100% in, in uh, has been passed. Reopening of Ontario Act 2020. Next, Dini Kalkin. Hi, Brian. Thank you for having this session. Can I ask the concierge staff who are working behind a barrier six feet or more, should they be wearing a mask at all times while they are on duty? So the answer is no. Um, the, um, the legislation basically, or the policies basically say that um, if you can be um, uh, at least two meters away from the other people, you don't have to wear. Uh, you don't have to wear. Um, uh, you, if you're at least, if you if you are at least two meters away, okay, um, then you 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 will be wearing your mask, okay, and be two meters away, all right. But you don't have to wear the mask if you've got the plexiglass. That's how it works. So you don't have to wear the mask and be behind the plexiglass. It's one or the other. And for the concierge who's sitting behind the desk for at least eight to 10 hours a day, it would be highly uncomfortable to be wearing that mask. So the plexiglass is working much better. Alexander Homison, would the flushing of kitchen cleanouts to prevent backups be considered an essential work? Again, we'll have to look at the regs, um, but you know what? The flushing of kitchen cleanouts that is done every so often, um, I don't think that's going to fall within um, an essential work. You know, I, I just don't think so. Unless you can prove that, you know, the flooding is imminent, which I don't think you'll be able to do. Miriam Hamel, we are a self-managed board of a townhouse complex. Does reporting of COVID-19 cases apply to us? I'm going to say yes, it does. And the, um, the reporting which you have to do um, is you have to have a, um, a designated contact person. And that person, if you're um, self-managed, will be, you know, whoever is running the, running the condo. It could be a board member. But yes, you'd have to report as well because it is a workplace. Cheng Wang, just a point, Toronto Fire Services requiring annual fire inspection in suite and common elements should be done before the annual due date. Well, yes, of course it should be. But again, we have the pandemic issue and owners are very reluctant and in some cases rightly so 
from allowing the inspections to move forward. So, um, you know, you can try your best and perhaps there's something, you know, that could have been worked out as far as the owner or the resident not being home when the inspection was being done. Um, of course, now that is even more difficult with a stay at home order because how are you going to stay at home uh, when you don't want to be home when the uh, people are doing their inspections? Ovation. Hi, Brian. How do we how do we restrict visitors coming to the property? And well, there's a uh, you have a, you put in place a policy. Um, you can start by as well uh, restricting your visitor parking. Uh, that would help. Um, you know the concierge uh, needs to advise people that who come that that uh, there should be no visitors. The people that are subject to an exemption for visitors, they should have already provided concierge or management who will then provide the concierge with a list of people who are able to um, have uh, visitors and when I say visitors I mean uh, those people that are you know living by themselves and they're exempted from this where they are able to have somebody to come in or a home care uh, for uh, um, you know for people that need uh, assistance etc. We have more questions here. Um, I'm just going to uh, stop with um, answering some questions for a moment and I just want to talk about policies because um, they have been mentioned briefly uh, especially by our good friend Harlan Stavis always coming up with questions good ones so let's go to some policies here interesting policies for condos number one uh, we spoke about a no visitor policy and again, it's hard to enforce. Um, closure of outdoor amenities, something to think about. As we said before, the new regulations, the new recommendations are, you can only have a maximum of five people in an outdoor social setting. Um, and that would be, of course, in compliance with the stay at home order, so you can go out for exercise. So do you, do you consider closing your outside amenities? Another issue to consider is should you uh, require masking or uh, face coverings in outdoor common elements um, if it's not possible to maintain a two meter distance? What about congregating on common elements? Should there be a policy for that? As again, uh, as far as the visiting or no visitors, we spoke about no visitor parking passes. I think that's a consideration. Um, the issue has been coming up today about in-suite renovations and that should, the exception to that should be emergency repairs and that was sort of what Paula was referring to, an emergency repair. Um, if it's a non-urgent repair, they, it should or may have to be postponed based on the regulations. You need to think about um, in-person real estate showings, whether you know that should be allowed or not. Um, there's no open houses, we know, we know that. And the question is what about in-person showings. Um, again, the government has failed the residents by allowing short-term rentals, but only for housing purposes. So, you know, I am confused as to what it means to allow short-term rentals, but for housing purposes. So I guess what they're trying to say is to use short-term rentals um, as a hotel, as a, you know, obviously for less than 30 days, but to use it for, well, it couldn't be for visitors or out of town people because nobody's coming, but, you know, to use it somewhat like a hotel, you know, renting it out on a nightly basis, that's not going to be allowed. But what does it mean you can still use it for housing purposes? Um, certainly many of the condos, um, you know, having are having major problems with short-term rentals and, uh, and they're always uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of the, some short-term rental operators are very responsible. But there's a segment that really feels that rules are not for them, and as long as they can rent out their units, you know, who gives a hoot whether they they're spreading, um, you know, a virus to the residents in the building or not. So again, uh, short-term rentals to me should be out. It, it shouldn't be, you know, you can't do that except for housing purposes, which just confuses the whole issues. And again, if you're going to have uh, food delivery coming to the units, a lot of people do today. Um, I think it's a good idea to allow the food delivery right up to the door because this way it assists people not coming out and it assists in the stay-at-home order. 
All right, let's get back to some questions here. Holy moly, lots of questions today. Um, property manager, I assume we are back to no cleaners, dog walkers, <laughs> realtor showings, and in-suite work. Uh, property manager, you are 100% correct. As I started today's AMA, not only are we back to where we started in March of 2020, we are worse. All right. Um, here's a new question from Harland. Do you suggest that we pass a bylaw to allow electronic meetings since the CAO is now looking at allowing electronic meetings? It's a very good question. As everybody knows, number one, you can't have an in-person meeting now, impossible. So if you're going to have a meeting, you have to have it virtually. And if you're having it virtually, you will have to have electronic voting or voting by paper proxies or uh, electronic proxy submission or all of the, all of the above. And so um, the, the fact is that if you're going to vote by way of, of electronic uh, voting, the uh, province of Ontario has amended the Condominium Act whereby you can have electronic voting without the necessity of a bylaw up until um, I believe it's the end of May of 2021. Uh, now, what Harland is saying is that there was a, a recent email blast from um, on ON Condo. I think that's what they call it. This is the government um, website. They sent something out that said they are considering um, moving forward with some type of per perhaps amendment whereby you could have electronic uh, voting and virtual meetings without the necessity for a bylaw. Uh, but they haven't made a pronouncement on that. And because of the state, the status of the legislation now, you can only have a virtual meeting and electronic voting without a bylaw up until the end of May 2021. After end of May 2021, you will not be able to have a virtual meeting or use electronic voting um, unless you have a bylaw in place. And that's why we've recommended to our very many condo corporations is you should pass your bylaw now when you don't need the bylaw for the uh, meeting. So you pass it now because you, you can go forward with electronic voting and a virtual meeting right now without the bylaw. You pass your bylaw and whether or not the government waives the necessity for a bylaw after May or not, you're still in good condition because you already got yours. So I'm going to just say this to you, Harlan. The government of Ontario has a million amendments to the Condominium Act on the books that have not yet come into force. And they've been sitting there forever. These amendments haven't been put into, into force yet. So I... I would hope that the government would, would either extend the deadline of the end of May 2021 to allow people to have virtual meetings and electronic voting um, without the necessity of the bylaw, or they would amend the Condominium Act. But again, you know, I want to be, I'd rather be safe than sorry. And if I need to have the bylaw in place, I'd rather have it in place and not wait end endlessly for the government. I don't want to be in a position or the clients don't want to be in a position that they can't have an owner's meeting or a vote because they don't have a bylaw and they're not allowed to get together because of social distancing rules and, you know, in a stay-at-home orders. So good question there. Uh, we have a, another question from Bruna. Bruna is a manager at Young at Avenue Road in St. Clair, and she does a lovely job there. I wish Doug Ford could take the condo sector more seriously and give clear directions as to how everyone involved would be affected. We are left with too much guessing. So, you know, Bruna is um, not 100% right there. She's 1,000% right. I don't understand. The condo sector is so large. I, we keep having this recurring issue where, uh, you know, laws are passed, regulations are passed, orders come into place, and nobody thinks of the condo sector when it's such a large sector uh, of, of the, such a large housing sector. So how is it possible? And the only thing I can think of is that the people that are passing the legislation, they never lived in condos. 
So because they never lived in condos, does that mean that nobody lives in condos? You would think that if you're representing everybody, everybody includes a huge segment called condo dwellers. And the fact that they don't take care when passing legislation and orders, etc., of the condominium sector puts everybody uh, into a, a difficult situation. So I'm going to go back to Bruna's issue right now because I will tell you that um, the last time um, the government came out with recommendations and advice, I think it had to do with um, could the gyms remain open or not. And there was, um, you know, a, a um, if you read the regulations, um, the answer was no, gyms in condos had to be closed. But somebody at the one of them at the, the ministry or in the government picked up the phone when somebody in the condominium industry called and said can we have our gym open and the guy on the phone said well of course you can and so email blasts went out through the whole condo industry that the government says you can do it well the government didn't say you could do it and when the president of bruno's condo corp sent a specific email saying this is what's happened and this is what this guy said can we have the gym open or not they said well i think you should speak to your lawyer so my advice to the government is don't give either don't answer the phone I mean, you probably never do anyways but if you answer the phone don't give legal advice because you can't and send out the regulations as soon as possible and make those regulations comprehensive enough so that the condominium industry knows what's going on so i will tell you this um in the last uh, information handout from the government they put on something which they've never done before. And that is that there's a statement now that says the material is not legal advice and does not purport to be or to provide an interpretation of the law. In the event of any conflict or difference between this summary and any applicable legislation, call Brian Horlick. No, they didn't say call me, but they did say the legislation and the regulations prevail. So they're finally understanding that you know you got to look to the regulations if you want to get the right answer and the regulations or the answers are only as good as the regulations which need to be properly drafted so doug ford if you're listening and eileen develis if you're listening please help out the condo sector next paul tavares he's out of the shower okay and he has something to say all right i have to run <laughs> But I'd like to thank you for the great session and take this opportunity to wish Rudy Petershofer, a personal friend and co-worker in attendance, a happy birthday. Yeah, Rudy, happy birthday. You're looking good. All right. Next. Whoops. Eli, Eli Shermersky. Stay at home orders. That is, does it apply to all condo managers? Well, that's a good question. The stay at home order applies to everybody, but there are exceptions. And one of the exceptions is for uh, workers who, you know, must be on the job. And I'm going to say that for a condominium manager, I don't think you have to be um, on the job in the office 24 seven. Uh, but I do think that it's important that you do be in the job at the office for certain things, uh, which can't be cannot be done remotely. So the whole purpose of the stay at home is to be at home, but there are exceptions to that. And one of those exceptions is when you have to be, you know, in the office to do your work. So here, the businesses must ensure that any employees who can work from home do so. Um, but that is the exception is when you need to be at your office to do certain things that, that can't be done remotely. So there's your standard lawyer's answer, which says yes and no at the same time. Next. Miriam Hamel. Does it apply to residents as well? Currently, we don't know if a resident contracted COVID unless they have informed a board member in confidence. So this question relates to the notification requirements 
from the letter of instruction that the City of Toronto gave out. And as I said before, there is a um, question that needs an answer. And the question is that uh, you need to report if uh, two or more people have tested positive for COVID within a 14-day period. Uh, and this legislation mostly is supposed to be dealing with quote-unquote workers, which is a defined term, but the um, notification requirements deal with people, which is not a required term. And you would assume that people encompasses more than workers. So I'm going to take the position that I can only, you know, provide advice and understand the things that I read that are clear and people are people and people include workers. So I'm going to say that if residents have uh, COVID-19, that triggers the notification requirement. And again, you're not going to know unless someone's going to tell you. John Margaret says, hello, also an excellent manager. Jerry Awori, how about moving in and out of a condo? Well, um, you know, I, I don't see how if you have to move out. Um, again, the, we took a look at the regs, but, you know, you know, if you sold your condo and someone's got to move in and you got to move out, you know, I can't see how you're going to be prohibited from doing that. Brian, when will COVID-19 end? I understand you have a crystal ball. Well, I do have a crystal ball. Unfortunately, um, the crystal ball right now is a bit murky and I don't have the answer yet, but I'm going to have it soon. I can only suggest that you keep coming to the AMA and at one point in time, we will have an answer for you, Mr. Kapoor. All right, John Margaret, a resident installed a door stopper at the suite door. I asked him to remove it and he said that his handyman will come after the lockdown. Can I use the corporation contractor to remove it now as a, as a fire code safety issue? So um, I'm going to suggest that my answer is going to be yes. Um, if he can't get a contractor to come out because of the lockdown, I'm going to say yes. Um, um, you can use a, a corporation's contractor for that. And Catherine Barbellini, she didn't have enough, so she's back again. Just to confirm, as of 12.01, which is when the, um, the uh, stay-at-home order comes into place, will real estate showings be permitted? Again, I'm assuming there's going to be something in the regs dealing with that. But uh, stay at home. Um, you don't want to have people coming into your unit. Uh, I'm going to suggest that... Um, you know, the, you, you may have a policy of no showings during this period of time, uh, you know, but then again, um, you know, I can't exactly give you the answer, but it will be in the FAQ with respect to real estate showings, because right now, how could you um, have a stay at home order? Those people who are, you know, coming uh, to see the unit, they should be staying home. And so to me, um, I think a real estate showing should be put on a pause for the moment. The, the uh, situation in Ontario um, and the legislation and the directives are all uh, with respect to, uh, you know, main, uh, trying to keep interpersonal, um, uh, interpersonal meetings uh, or, or, uh, to a minimum. And that would include a real estate showing. Peter Leon, hardworking board member, condominium down by the lake. How are you, Peter? Hi, Brian. Happy New Year, and thank you for this informative session today. Peter, you're very welcome. When your comments come out for the FAQs, could you comment on the word essential as it relates to construction in the new provincial government ruling? Yes, we are going to put out our FAQ, and we're going to make it as um, descriptive as we can and try to answer as many questions as we can, and there are many. Angeline Constantine, also condominium manager, doing a fine job in these turbulent times. Hi, Brian. Two or more people test positive, informing the ministry within 14 days, considered within a household, more than one person or within the building. So let me read that again. Two or more people test positive, informing to the ministry within 14 days, considered within a household, um, I'm not quite understanding the question, but if there's two or more people, whether they're in the same household or not, 
and they test positive within 14 days, um, that is going to um, trigger the notification requirement. Next question. Good afternoon, Brian. How should a property management company proceed if a manager is interfering with the liens collections process despite directions to follow corporate policy? Um, I think it would be a good time to um, send a warning letter to the manager that he or she is not complying with the corporate policy and if they continue, um, it might be the time to say um, goodbye to that manager. Um, the manager also could be under excessive pressure from the board, we don't know. So you may want to have a change in a management, a management personnel and maybe put someone else in there and have this manager go to a, another building. Uh, it's a difficult situation because you say the manager is interfering with the liens collection policy, which shouldn't be. Uh, I would, as a, a property management company, I would speak with the board and see what the instructions are from the board, which may be inconsistent uh, with the condo uh, management policy. And, and sometimes the boards um, try to you know, assist uh, in becoming involved with day-to-day -day management where really that should be the purview of your professional condominium manager. Okay, a few last questions because we're at 104 and I, after one o'clock I start charging. I believe curbside pickup, this is from Ulana, I believe curbside pickup is a better option to allow 20, 30, 40 or more delivery people into a condo lobby elevator hallways. Um, interesting, interesting comment. Um, Ulana is saying that she feels that the owners shouldn't, um, that the, the people that are delivering shouldn't go up to the suites. Um, they should, it, it should be curbside pickup where the people go down um, to get, I guess, their food or their deliveries. Um, again, I think uh, it's a very good comment. I think that you have to consider the size of the building and maybe the demographics of the building. Are you dealing with young people, old people? Is it a, you know, 800 units there where everybody is ordering uh, food to come in and all these uh, delivery people are coming in at the same time? Or is it, you know, uh, older people that really aren't mobile? So a lot of um, um, considerations have to go into that, but I think it's a very insightful comment, Ulana. Thank you. All right. Bruna, thank you. Brian, Cheng Wang, thank you. You are great. Dorina, thank you. Family tapers, dama comasita. Well, I don't know what it means, but I'm going to look it up afterwards. I hope you're not swearing at me. <laughs> Mary D. Oliveira, hi Brian. Do you have a better understanding of what has been deemed as essential for common area refurbishment work? We have a lot of mixed info. I guess you are listening to the government of Ontario um, uh, news flashes. You see uh, the government. Uh, personnel on TV doing press conferences. The regulations haven't been uh, totally completed yet and everything is a mess. So let me tell you, Mary, uh, we will be addressing this exact question in our FAQ the moment the regs come out and we're happy to send that to you if you're not on our list already. Um, I'm going to um, just say a few other things before we sign off and we're going to sign off in a minute. Our Meetings are going great. I said that already. Um, we have uh, done a tremendous amount, hundreds of condo meetings, electronic voting meetings with our software. They're going really fantastic. Um, I mentioned before that Julia Lurier, who was on maternity leave, is now back from maternity leave. And she is swamped with work, but always looking for new clients. She's doing a great job. She has agreed to host an AMA in the next few weeks and she'll be doing that and we're all excited for her to do that and I'm going to read as I always do we have some fan mail specifically about Julia and Julia chaired um, an AGM using the electronic voting software and the manager made sure to write and said Julia thank you for all your hard work an impeccable job yesterday between you and your office it was wonderful and we thank you so much for being there to chair and providing your electronic voting software. All right, last question here. How do we know if there's a COVID case if residents don't inform us? From Nicole Yu, you will not know. 
Mr. Stavis thanks me very much for conducting a very informative AMA, as does Nita G, a manager down by the lake, I assume. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, I believe Bradley Chaplick will be hosting the AMA. Um, we've gone through a very full agenda today. Again, if you're not on our email blast, we send out our COVID FAQs every Monday or Tuesday. You need to get on that email blast. Uh, we give you all the information and um, it's very relevant and timely. So I want everybody to keep safe. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, obviously, we look forward to the day when uh, we can say that in my crystal ball, COVID is done or I can give you an exact date. I won't have a press conference, I assure you, and I won't have previews leading up to the big news, but I will give you the news when it happens. So again, keep safe, be well, and it's Brian Horlick trying to take care of all of your condo business and all of your questions. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Bradley Chaplick will be here. Bye-bye.